Welcome back to the classroom, my name is Mr. Wong and today we'll be covering collision theory and rates of reaction. So our lesson intention is to define what collision theory is and to investigate the factors that influence rates of reaction. The success criteria is to describe how each factor can influence the rate of reaction. So let's talk about how we can get chemical reactions to occur and that is collisions. We stated in previous lessons but for chemical reaction to occur, it all has to do with how things collide with each other. There are three main important things in a chemical reaction, as you might recall. And this falls under what we call the collision theory. The collision theory explains to us and outlines how a chemical reaction will occur. That is, the starting reactant must collide, hence collision theory. These collisions must be in the correct orientation. We'll talk about what we mean by orientation. And they must have sufficient energy to cause a rearrangement. Now you might remember what we talked about from last lesson about sufficient energy, and that is to do with a concept called activation energy. Okay, so let's just quickly look back on this concept and also the concept of correct orientation when it comes to making things collide and react. So first thing, the importance of orientation. Reacting molecules must collide in the correct orientation so that the particular bonds in the reactants are broken and new bonds or bonds are formed. So let's look at the example with hydrogen iodide. It forms hydrogen gas and iodine gas as well. Now, we have four different images, or two images really. So the first category we have, uh, or first category we have here, we have the iodine ion. So this one is the iodine, or iodine there. These two are colliding with each other. Now, they're not in the correct orientation. The reason being, if you look at the chemical reaction, we want to get hydrogen to, to be created. When iodine and iodine collide like so, you can see that the hydrogens are not aligned in a position where they can also bond with each other. So this reaction won't be favorable. It won't occur and form this decomposition reaction we have here. Now, let's look at this other scenario where the hydrogens are both facing each other. So hydrogen here, hydrogen here, iodine here. Now you can see how the hydrogens and iodines are facing the correct orientation where they can, when they collide, break off the bond between the iodine and form with the other hydrogen. So this is the importance of orientation in this context of chemical reactions. Next we have is activation energy. So we said that when things collide, they have some form of kinetic energy in that collision. Even if they have the correct orientation, here's a couple of things to take into account. If there is sufficient energy, they will break itself apart in the context of our um, hydrogen iodide. If there's not enough energy, we'll see a, a situation where they just kind of bounce off each other because there's not enough energy to actually break the bonds apart. So that's the issue we have here. You can think of it using our energy profile diagrams. Remember, activation energy is the minimum amount of energy required for a successful collision to occur. When we start with the reactants, they can be colliding already, but there's not enough energy to ensure that they separate and rearrange. You can see in this diagram, which portrays an exothermic reaction, when it reaches that activation energy, it transitions to another chemical represented by the change in color. Okay, so you can see that comes down into a different color. You can also see there was a little wave going out and that was representing the amount of heat that was released from that exothermic reaction. So those are your two main criterias, um, considering that collision and colliding the correct orientation can be one thing. Okay, so let's go into some questions. Reactions used in chemical explosives are often very fast. Would this represent a high or low activation energy in the chemical substance? So 
With the thing with chemical explosives, there's a couple of features we can look into. There is a release of heat. Okay, so that represents we have an exothermic reaction. If that's the case, we also know, and we also know that it often occurs very quickly. So, if it's an exothermic reaction, they tend to have a lower activation energy than endothermic reactions. But more importantly, the concept of a really fast reaction would represent we have a very low activation energy. Because a low activation energy would mean that we're more likely to see the reaction occur a lot sooner than one with a much higher activation energy. Question two, describe two features that are required of colliding gas molecules if they are to successfully react and produce new chemical products. First one, correct orientation. And you can outline it a little bit more than this. Correct orientation uh, during collision. And also the second point would have to be having sufficient energy. That could be either equal to or greater than the activation energy. Okay, uh, excuse the spelling, obviously. So now let's look at the need for fast chemical reaction. We've looked at the reasonings why chemical reaction occurs. Let's now look at why we want fast or slower chemical reactions and how can we actually do it. But when it comes to rates of reaction, what do we mean by that? The average rate of reaction over a small time interval is measured as the change in concentration divided by time, okay? So when we're looking at rates of reaction, we wanna see how can we change the overall concentration or the change of that, or how can we minimize the time for that to occur or increase that amount of time to occur? That's what we mean by rate of reaction. Can we make it faster? Can we make it slower? There are five ways you can sort of control the rate of a chemical reaction. One is by controlling the surface area. So by making it bigger or smaller. Two, that could be the concentration of the overall reactants in the solution. So how much starting material do you have? If you're dealing with gaseous reactants, so you're dealing with gases, you could alter it in terms of the pressure. You could also deal with volume. If it's a liquid, okay, so you can alter that around. You can also change the temperature of the reaction and you can use a catalyst in the reaction as well. So these are five different ways you can influence the rate of a chemical reaction. Let's start off with the presence of a catalyst. So a catalyst is a chemical substance that increases the rate of reaction without undergoing a permanent chemical change in the reaction. So it's like a matchmaker. It brings two things together in the correct orientation and kind of plugs them together. It itself is not part of the reaction. It just helps facilitate the reaction to occur. If you have a look here, uh, this is what we call a catalytic converter. So in um, internal combustion engine cars, they will have some of these. And it's to introduce oxygen to react with a chemical called carbon monoxide, CO. And it actually splits the oxygen particles into two, and that allows one of the oxygen to latch onto the carbon monoxide to make carbon dioxide. Now, some of you who are aware of, um, you know, the way greenhouse gases work and climate change, would know that carbon dioxide is a potent greenhouse gas. Now you might be wondering why exactly are we trying to produce more carbon dioxide? Now, well, the reason is quite simple. Carbon monoxide is actually highly toxic uh, in large quantities. And this is actually one of the main gases that are produced in internal combustion engines. So in like a car uh, powered by petrol. 
Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to avoid. If you have too much of this, you can actually cause carbon monoxide poisoning. While as carbon dioxide is not a irritant that can inhibit hemoglobin uh, from absorbing oxygen, this can actually, when it goes to your bloodstream, can actually prevent your blood from holding on to any oxygen molecules. So you much rather breathe in carbon dioxide than you would breathe in carbon monoxide. Now, because the purpose of the catalyst is to allow for the correct orientation of collision, it also means that you will require less energy for a successful collision to occur. So we talked about the concept of activation energy, as you can see here. Now, without a catalyst, the activation energy is quite high. But if you introduce a catalyst into the reaction, you actually can lower the reaction or the activation energy, which means you get also a faster so you can also make it faster to transition from here to here. Okay, so that's the purpose of the catalyst to decrease the activation energy. The next one we have is concentration. So as we said before, collision is about things colliding. So according to collision theory, if I have a really low concentration, the likelihood of these particles colliding with each other is much lower than if I had a much higher concentration. So by increasing the concentration of my reactants, I can effectively increase the amount of available collisions. And so I have a faster chemical reaction. Next one is surface area. Now this one's a little bit of a whiffy woffy one, but take it this way. Imagine you have a chemical reaction and you have a big cube, okay? Now compare that to when that cube is split up into smaller cubes. The main difference is the whatever you're trying to react it with, there's a greater chance of successful collisions, okay, as a smaller thing. So as a big cube, you can actually see all this inner particles, that's not exposed to the reaction until you actually take away the other components, only this part will then start reacting. But if you, you know, crunch a chemical compound into smaller, finer powders, like so, you expose it to more successful collisions. So that's what changing surface area can do. So if you try, if you have, you know, some kind of, um, you know, salt compound, if you try and crunch it up into a finer powder, you're more likely to see it uh, react more quickly than if it was just a solid rock type structure. Next one we have is the change in temperature. You can sort of see the difference already here. If we're in a really cold temperature, let's say zero degrees Celsius, you can see that the particles are moving a lot slower than a high temperature, let's say 60 degrees. And we already said that prior um, energy it have, plays an important role in collision. You need to have sufficient energy to su surpass the activation energy to have a successful collision. So let's kind of compare the pair. Let's have a particle that's at room temperature. Room temperature, if you don't remember, is about 25 degrees Celsius. Now this region here that we've highlighted, that's any particles that have sufficient energy to cause collision. So energy for collision. Okay, so it's this small percentage here. Now, if we were to increase the temperature of the entire system, what you can see here is there are more particles compared to the original that have energy for a successful collision. So it's all this region here this is all extra particles that now have enough energy just with a 20 degree Celsius increase that can cause a successful collision. The reason being by increasing the temperature, you'll have more particles that have enough energy to surpass the activation energy and therefore more successful collisions will or may occur. So there's that. And remember, this is all down to increasing the percentage of successful collisions doesn't guarantee that the collisions will be 100% more successful, 
but it does increase the probability of it occurring. The next one we have is changing pressure. So this applies for gas molecules, so it doesn't really apply for water. So the next we have is changing pressure. Just keeping count though, this applies for gas molecules, not liquids or solids, because you can't compress liquids and solids. For gas particles, if you increase the pressure, you increase the likelihood of collisions occurring because there's less space for the particles to move around. So they're bound to collide with each other. So as you can see with this sort of charts that we have here. So by increasing the pressure, we create more potential successful collisions with the gas particles because they just don't have anywhere to move. All right, so let's quickly summarize all these points. If we increase temperature, we increase the kinetic energy, so the energy of movements of these particles. As a consequence of increased energy, we also increase the successful collisions that may occur. Increasing concentration, surface area, or pressure will increase the frequency of collisions of the particles. If we have a catalyst, we will lower the activation energy and the re reactant particles require less energy to have a successful collision. So all these factors come down to two main things. Okay, There's only two things these um, factors take into account. One is the percentage of collision. Are we increasing or decreasing the percentage of collision? And then number two is are we changing energy all right so these five factors that we talked about only account for these two reasons okay so we go to the last question of this powerpoint it says explain why the rate of the reaction increases when the volume of the system decreases for this particular reaction so we have hydrogen gas plus iodine gas to form hydrogen iodide. Firstly, let's try and balance the chemical equation. So we have two hydrogens, two iodines. We only have one of each on this side. So we're gonna put a two here as a coefficient to balance out the equation. So we're saying that the reaction rate increases as the volume decreases. What actually happens when we decrease volume is we actually increase pressure. You might wonder how that works. Now think about it this way. We have H2, we have I2. And let's draw a couple of them. If we decrease the amount of space they can belong in or they can be in, you can see how that also means an increase in pressure because there's less space for these particles to move. Okay, so what's actually happening is a decrease in volume, decrease in volume, increases pressure, hence increases the potential collisions between H2 and I2. So that completes the question. And that also concludes our lesson for today. Thank you so much for joining to the very end. Um, and hopefully this video was of use to you. Okay, and I'll see you next time, enjoy.